I think we're all friends here, right? So I'm just going to be honest. I think building front-end JavaScript applications can be pretty bloody hard. And there are a bunch of factors that contribute to this. And part of it is that they're just these giant balls of state and events, right? So I thought it would be really interesting to take a bit of a step back and I guess play the devil's advocate and take a critical look at some of the patterns that we're using in thick client JavaScript applications and see if they're giving us ways of managing state and events in a scalable and maintainable fashion. And then we can take a look at some of the tactics that we can use to help us better embrace state and events without sacrificing clarity in our architecture. But first I'll just introduce myself. This is Alama, it's not me. Um, I'm Amy, I've come over from New Zealand and I live in a town called Wellington. So if you're ever over in New Zealand and you want to hang out, you can give me a shout on the Twitter. I'm a meep on Twitter um, and pretty much everywhere else on the internet. <coughs> and I work at GitHub. So I've got two confessions to make before I get started. The first is that last week I spent the week hanging out with all the GitHubers from around the world at our company meeting, and so subsequently I have the summit plague, which is why my voice sounds like this. So please bear with me. I might need to drink a lot of water. Um, and the second confession is that my job at GitHub has nothing to do with writing JavaScript. Please don't leave, please don't leave, hear me out. I spend my day hacking on uh, native applications, so I work on the team that builds GitHub for Mac and GitHub for Windows. And I'm a Windows developer, so please, again, stay, bear with me, bear with me, it's fine. <laughs> I, write, I write lots of C-sharp in my day job, but before I was at, before, C-sharp is actually a really great language, before I was, <laughs> Before I was at GitHub, I was writing lots of JavaScript. I was building thick client JavaScript applications. And the thing that's really interesting about desktop application architecture and client-side JavaScript application architecture is they have quite a lot in common, right? And the thing that ties them together is the amount of state that we're concerned with. So JavaScript applications contain heaps of different kinds of state. We've got the state of our core entities, like the models, uh, and that often needs to be kept in sync with the state that's on the server. We've got the state of the address bar. We've got the state of all of the different views that are being presented at any given point in time. And then we've got to manage the overall state of the application. So there's a lot of state to think about. So state on its own isn't really that interesting. What makes an application interesting is if we're able to interact with that state, right, and force new states on the application. And we do this via events. We force state transitions via events. So what I mean by state transition is think of a form, right, and we've got some data being input into the form, and we click a save button, and our model transitions into a new state, perhaps an invalid state. And there's so many different ways that we can make interesting things happen in our application or transition state. We've got DOM events, things like click, drag, key up. We've got model events, so in frameworks like Backbone, we have an on change function and we register callbacks to that so we get notified about interesting things that happen on the model. And we've got routing events. And those are normally fired when the address bar is going to change. So, and that's normally going to kick off a series of transitions, right? The models are going to change, the views on the screen are going to change. There's a whole bunch of state that's going to transition at that point. So we've got lots of state and we've got lots of events and they all need to be managed. And as complexity grows, like our code base gets bigger, we get more developers on the team, new features are being added. If we're not careful, we can end up in the corner, crying alone, feeling really sorry for ourselves and questioning our life decisions, right? And we don't want that, that sucks. So we've got to have a plan. So I thought we'd just take a look at a, this is a somewhat contrived example, but you can imagine this kind of architecture being extrapolated out to a really large code base, and hopefully you'll be able to see the reasons why this isn't so great. So here we've got a view which contains some information about um, a party. So we've got some party animals. Party dog is getting down. And we also have an invitation list. Um, and when the button is gonna be clicked, something interesting is gonna happen. We're gonna invite something to a, a new animal to the party. And boom, we're clicked. And we're gonna do a bunch of semi-terrible things here. We're going to reach into the DOM using jQuery to query the current state of the party, which is being stored in the DOM, which is kind of weird. We're gonna query that current state, and we're gonna, uh, sorry, the invitation list, we're gonna pull that out, we're gonna append uh, that animal to the party, and we're gonna build up a new view, and then write that back to the DOM. 
So we've conflated a whole bunch of ideas here. We've conflated models with views. We've conflated views with state. And the view is in charge of transitioning the state into new states via events, right? So this feels wrong for a whole lot of reasons. And it's easy to see that when state and state transition gets intertwined like this at scale, we're going to end up with an unmaintainable code base, a brittle code base, and a hard-to-test code base. So the management of state and its transition got out of control. So basically, the more of it you have, the harder it all becomes to manage. You've really got to have a plan. Hooray, this is where design patterns come in, right? <clears throat> they come in to save our sanity, to prevent us from being that developer in the corner feeling bad about our life decisions. And the thing that I really love about software is that we're able to take solutions from wildly different contexts and apply them in a new environment to help us solve new problems, right? So, for example, the problem of separating view and data and events. And because we can take uh, ideas and inspiration from other places, design patterns tend to evolve in a really organic fashion. The spread of design patterns is really similar to the spread of memes on the internet. Actually, the word meme, it means anything that's spread or inherited in a non-genetic fashion, right? So meme just means idea. Any idea that's spread from one place to the next and it sticks because it's funny or it, became, or it contains the solution for a really tricky problem. And if you take the MV star family of patterns, so like MVC, which is a common one that we see, those presentation patterns, they actually originated out of applications built for the desktop, right? I'm talking about the small talk days. And over time, people saw the value of those patterns and web and web server programming became really, really popular. And we started to apply those patterns there. And now we're back to applying those patterns on the browser in the client with JavaScript. And I'm deliberately using the phrase MV star here rather than MVC specifically because there are a whole lot of flavours. There's model view presenter, model view view model, and they're all, at, at heart, they're all trying to achieve exactly the same thing. They're all trying to separate our concerns, our data from our views, our state from our transition. And it's this very fact alone that's going to help us bring structure to our code. So let's take a, take a stock of the current state of play in the client versus server world. So we've got web server frameworks like Rails, right, that are written in the MVC style. <clears throat> and we've got these kick-ass JavaScript applications which are written in frameworks that also claim to be implementing MVC. What gives? Well, I really, I'm not interested in turning this into a conversation of like who's doing MVC by the book, right? That's not very interesting. But I think what is interesting is to figure out what flavors of MVC and, and how they affect how we manage state and transition in each cases. So which ideas can stick and which ones are causing us too much pain and friction in a really event, evented and stateful world like we see on the client. <clears throat> so let's take a step back and take a look at what's going on in the server. Hopefully this is going to be a bit of a reminder, so I'll, qu I'll just quickly go through it. So we've got our models. They're the guts of your application, right? This is where all your domain logic is going to occur. And then we have the presentation of those models. And that's typically in the form of a JSON document or an HTML document that we're returning. And they are really representations of current state, right? You can think of them like a snapshot of a model's current state. And then we have our controllers. And they're responsible for sending commands down to the model, maybe to query its current state or to update its current state. And then it's going to return a snapshot of that model's current state, a JSON document or an HTML document. And the thing that ties them all together are our routers. So they're responsible for incoming, matching an incoming web request and then routing that off to a designated controller in action. And they normally do that by matching the pattern of the URL in combination with the HTTP verb that's being used. So how does this all relate to how state is managed on the web server? Well, that's just it. Hopefully you don't have state on your web server, right? Web applications that we're building typically are stateless in nature, and we do that for a whole bunch of reasons which mostly relate to scalability, right? We want to be able to deploy our app across multiple front-end servers and have them communicate with a back-end server. We want to be able to scale, right? So we achieve the statelessness by persisting to a data store of some kind. And so in this environment, 
where we're persisting state to a data store, we're able to address that state via HTTP. So like we're able to say something like, HTTP, get me all of the animals that are currently at the party. And what if we want to move into a new state? What if we want to execute an event? Perhaps one of our animals is behaving, misbehaving, we want to kick them out of the party. Well, we can simulate a state transition across the boundary by saying HTTP delete. And the controller is going to execute that function and return a new snapshot of the current state of the party. So what we've done here is we've simulated a state transition across the HTTP boundary. So you might have something like this on the server. We've got routes. We're defining a route for get, post, and delete on a um, whack party with an um, optional parameter animal. Um, and when that is invoked, we're going to invoke a controller. So here is the get case. We're going to take the incoming parameter. We're going to execute a search, and we're going to return a snapshot of the current view. With post, we're going to do something very similar, except this time we're going to change the state of the model and return a new snapshot. Same goes for delete. So we've got a router that matches a pattern, a controller with an action and vote, a model that may or may not be have its state transitioned, and a snapshot of that model state returned. So because of the client-server boundary, all of our states and all of our state transitions are necessarily addressable via HTTP, right? Like we wouldn't be able to change the state of the model without being able to address it. And so the way that we use routers and the way that MVC is designed on the server is that our architecture is very linear, right? The request comes in, we do something to it, something may or may not happen, and a, and a snapshot is returned. We go down the stack and up the stack. So the difference between how MVC is implemented on the server and what we see on the client, our stateful client, is that on the server we're trying super hard to be stateless and on the client we have all of this in memory ready to go. So we keep a bunch of things in memory on the client to help us form a really cohesive application. We've got uh, things like um, our models and that's usually cu coupled with that snapshot that comes back from the server. But then we add an extra layer of stuff on top of that. Validation, security, update functions, the number of possible states that our models can have on the server is larger than that, that than we can have on the uh, sorry the number of states that we can have on the client is larger than that we can have on the server we have our view state so we might be presenting lots of different views at any given point in time and together all of those different views define an overall view state can we see um, items in the menu bar are we able to edit uh, a view what's displayed in the main content region. All of this is adding complexity to the state space that we're managing. And then we have things like the overall application state, like which modules and controllers are currently active, which ones are not being used and we need to dispose of, free up memory to make sure we're writing a performant application. All of this different kinds of state means that what we're doing is traversing around a very non-linear state space, right? It's not the up the stack, down the stack, as we saw on the, on the server. <clears throat> so the other thing that's interesting about managing state on the client is that suddenly we're not having to emulate state transitions across the boundary. We can execute an event, call a method, a function, whatever it's called in your, your language of choice. You can execute that within the same execution context, right? Which is way more powerful than having to make a, a network call. So we've got a much richer set of concepts that we can architect our application around. And that's great, because in this really large state space, uh, moving around in a non-linear fashion gets complicated, and the dimensionality that we have makes it difficult to manage. So we really need to have a plan here, a long-term plan, to help us not become that sad developer in the corner feeling bad about our life choices. Um, so... Originally, we brought over to the client uh, some presentation patterns to help us deal with the complexity, right? We've got our models, our views, and controller, all the things that we saw on the server. Whatever the controller portion is, there's lots of different names for what you want to call that, um, as I mentioned earlier. And then we add the routing portion. And the first, as far as state's concerned, 
this feels a little weird to me, right? When I look at this list, the thing that pops out as being weird is, is routers. That is the need for routes on the client. The server was 100% stateless, so I can totally see that there would be need there. But, I mean, do we need them on the client? And it all feels a little weird until I'm like, of course we totally need them. We have an address bar and I totally need to be able to copy the URL of my web application and give that to my friend and have them see exactly what I see, right? Addressability on the client is still a key concern. So let's take a typical look at how that uh, architecture might scale, uh, might pan out when you're implementing MVC on the client and address, addressing the need of being able to address all parts, parts of the state space via the router. So I'm going to give this example in Backbone. So some of the object names might be different to what you're used to, or you may not even see some of these steps because the frameworks that you're using are hiding this all away from you, but the series of events is pretty much going to be the same. So here we have an animal model and we have a collection of party animals, which is really just a list of animals. And we have an anim animal view, which defines a template and a render function. And the render function is just going to take that template, it's going to take the collection of animals, it's going to mash them together and put something out onto the DOM. And then we have our router, and we're defining a couple of routes here, party and uninvite. And when each of those are invoked, when it detects a change in the address bar, we're going to call the function either start the party or revoke party rights. And revoke party rights is going to do a lookup, it's going to ch transition the state of the model, and then it's going to update the view. It's going to update the snapshot of the current state. And start the party is going to do something very similar. The only difference is it's not actually executing a state transition. So we're breaking encapsulation here in order to push everything up to the routing portion of our code. So we've got a view that's responsible for doing some initial rendering, but it also has a reference to our model. And then the route kicks off, and the first thing we do is look up that model when we already had a reference to it in our view. I'm feeling a bit weird about this. Um, this isn't, yeah, this is feeling weird. And then finally, we're going to need to update that view. We're going to re use jQuery to update the current state. So again, we're breaking encapsulation. The view already has a reference to those DOM elements. We're creating spaghetti-like code, which is going to become really difficult to maintain over time. The more of this that you add, the harder this is going to be. Able You're not going to be able to follow this non-linear state space very easily. <clears throat> is anyone able to grab me another glass of water? That would be amazing. Thank you. <clears throat> so on the client, we're often working with really stateful frameworks. And all of the objects that we need in order to perform a state transition are already instantiated. We already hold, hold them in there. Thank you. So there's no need for us to look them up again in that very linear fashion that we saw on the server. So we don't need to be structuring our application in the same way because we can embrace state. We don't need to be manipulating our models like the rows in a database. Our models can become real, rich, interactive, responsive objects. So we really want to be embracing state here and we really want to be embracing events. Because what we've done is we've taken those memes, those ideas from the server, and we've tried to apply that linear approach to a non-linear state space. And we've had to break encapsulation in order to do that. We started treating state and events like second-class citizens. And the code that we ended up with was a tangled web. So I feel like history is repeating itself, right? If you remember that example that I gave at the beginning of the talk of, the, of jQuery that was kind of managing the state and the view and it was all kind of happening in this weird soupy kind of thing, I feel like we're back to this again. We've just pushed it all up into the routing portion of our code because we're trying to emulate what the server architectures look like. And this kind of code doesn't scale well beyond the simple use case because it breaks encapsulation, because we can't test it, because we can't pull it apart. So I feel like we're back to square one again. We're sacrificing clarity in our architecture. So to build rich single page JavaScript applications, we still need to use routes. It's critical that we can address the state space. But in my mind, routes are a feature. They are not an architectural driver. They're not the cornerstone of our architecture. We really should be 
being concerned with events and state and architecting around those concepts. So are routes the problem here? But they're totally not the problem. The thing that's causing us pain with managing state and events is only using routes to drive our architecture. So we've discovered that separating concerns is really, really important. And that's why we implemented the MVC design pattern in the first place, to get rid of all of that shitty jQuery soup. But somewhere in the course of that, we too closely emulated what we saw on the server, and the cracks in that started to show. So thankfully, I think we can find a happy medium where we can embrace the need for addressability on the client, the need for routes, without relying on them to drive state changes within the application. So we're going to use events to help drive our architecture and we're going to build a composable architecture to help us better separate our concerns. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to refactor some of that bloated router code that I showed you. And so hopefully it's starting to become apparent that addressing a state transition like a delete is not the best thing to do. So we still have our models like we did before. And in Backbone, we now have an event hash. Well, this not now. I mean, I've just added it just now. That's been around in Backbone for a long time. And the idea here is, is that we can, cor we can correlate events that are occurring on the DOM to a function to call on our view. And in this case, we've got a delete function. And our delete function is going to use the model that it has a reference to, and it's going to destroy it. And then it's going to figure out that there's no need for this view to be around anymore and it's going to destroy itself. It's going to remove itself from the view. So where did the router go? There was no need for it here, right? The view could take care of itself. We don't need to do any unnecessary lookups to find what model to delete. And we're taking advantage of that state that was available to us by using declarative events and we can bind to that delete function. And the view's in charge, right, which is what we want. We don't want the router to be in charge. So this is fine. This is step one. Um, but as I said earlier, that routing is still a key part of our overall design. So how do we support the need for addressability of our states? Well, I think we can embrace the need for an event-rich MV whatever pattern and the need for routes with a clear architecture. So I'm going to show you a couple of ideas or memes or what have you that you can choose to apply uh, as you see fit, and they might help you. <coughs> so we're going to take our models. We're going to take those rich interactive objects that keep track of their own state and handle validation and raise events when they change state. We're going to take our views, which are responsible for rendering templates and mediating any interaction between the DOM and the view and vice versa. We're going to take all of that and we're going to give that to a controller, an actual controller object. And a controller object might be responsible for managing a couple of different models and a couple of different views at any point in time. We're going to take all of that and we're going to slide it into a logical component called a module. I want to do this for a bunch of reasons, for testability, for composability, and like it's just sensible, right? Um, so this guy, Justin Meyer, who wrote this framework called JavaScript MVC, which claims to be like a really true reference implementation of what MVC was supposed to be in uh, JavaScript, he said like, we want to be building large scale, huge JavaScript applications. We should, just, we should just not do that. Let's just stop and not build big applications. Let's build a whole lot of smaller applications, test those individually, and then bring them together, compose them at the end to form a larger application. And I really, really like this idea. And this is where the idea of modularity comes in. So a module is responsible for coordinating state and events of the views and models it contains, right? And, it, and it's at a really micro level. So I think modules are a really integral part of building any robust application architecture. And they usually define a, like a discrete area of functionality. So that's functionality that logically belongs together, right? And so within it, it can raise events, keep track of which views need to be presented, and manage its own internal state. So in JavaScript, we've got a couple of ways of implementing the module pattern. You could roll your own. It's a, the module pattern's a, a clearly defined pattern. Uh, you could do that using object literal notation if you want. You could use AMD modules. There's lots of different um, versions of that out there. Common JS modules. Lots of frameworks have their own uh, definition of what a module needs to look like. Um, there's, 
there's tons of different ways that you can do this and there's lots and lots of information out on there and I'm happy to give links to this afterwards if you would like them. So to note, one thing about modules that I've discovered is that they shouldn't be free to pres they should be free to present their own views, right? But they shouldn't be free to choose where on the application shell they present those views. So the application, some other object needs to take care of deciding where that module is allowed to place its views. And I think uh, that other object is something responsible for layout composition, so for composing all the different views on the screen. Now I'm gonna give this guy the name a layout manager because naming is hard and manager kind of sucks. I don't know, like if you've got any better ideas of what to call this. The idea is that it's an object responsible for composing lots of different views and deciding where they fit on the screen at any given point in time. So it's gonna define a shell right, an application shell with areas that modules can render their content in into, so like a sidebar, the main content view, any widget areas that you have. And importantly, when a module, a new module is activated, the layout manager is responsible for deciding where that module should render its content. So each, each module is gonna have the views that it wants to present and the layout manager is gonna figure out where they need to go. So this is an example of a layout manager in, has anyone heard of a framework called Marionette.js? Yeah, so I'm a big, big fan, there's a lot of great ideas uh, about composable um, composite architectures in that, um, in that library. It's really just a library that sits on top of Backbone that you can pick in the bits that you find interesting as you figure out whether they will work for you. So in Marionette, what you do is you define an overall application object. In my mind, I would rather see this be like layout manager or layout composer or something like that. And then you define a series of regions. So you're gonna say main content, sidebar, footer, all of those kinds of things. And then that gives you the hooks to do things like uh, when the application starts, for example, here we're saying the module foo, which we see defined just below, I'd like you to call the display function on that and I'm gonna pass you a region. And then that module is able to say, oh cool, thanks for the region, I've got a whole lot of views that I need to present and I'm gonna present those in the region that you've just given me. So that's, mar that's implemented in Marionette, but that's a concept that you can very easily roll into your own applications. So it's gonna look a little bit like this. I've got a bunch of modules presenting views at a micro level, and we've got a layout composer that's responsible for composing all of those modules views at a more macro level. So this placement occurs when? Like when does the layout composer know to start placing objects? When a new module is activated? How does this work? So the thing that needs to be responsible uh, in my opinion, the thing that needs to be responsible for determining whether it's time to invoke a new module is a dispatcher. So this is gonna be an object that listens for events on some pub publish and subscribe uh, subscription, and that's gonna listen for events that indicate that it's time for a new module to be loaded, a new module to be invoked. And on such events, it's gonna load that module up, it's gonna create an instance, and it's gonna hand it off to the layout manager who will then figure out where to place it on the screen. So that one of the interesting events that might mean that it's time to invoke a new set of modules, routes, right? A routing event might occur. So the router is gonna facilitate just purely an incoming URL, mapping that to a set of modules that need to be invoked, and then it's gonna raise an event that the dis dispatcher is then listening to. So it's responsible for observing those changes and reacting to them. It's not responsible for doing any lookups. It's not responsible for executing any state transitions. All it is is delegating off to another object. So it's delegating to the dispatcher. Um, so here's an example of what a dispatcher might look like. This is all just stubbed code. So we might wanna keep track of, say the previous route for reasons of moving backwards and forwards. We're gonna need to keep track of the current modules that we have uh, loaded at any given point in time and the current route that we're on. When we set up, we're gonna subscribe to that publish and subscribe channel that I mentioned so that when the router raises its event to say that something interesting has happened, it can take in the parameters of which modules to load um, and it can, it can hear that event. And we're gonna load those modules, right? So this is, gonna, this is the point where we're gonna load them into memory and then hand them off to the layout manager to do something interesting with. And this is cool because 
the dispatcher can also do things like, oh, I noticed that we've got all of these modules that we're not using anymore. I can clean those up, clear the memory, keep our application stable and performant. So we're gonna tack on the dispatcher, which is responsible for creating those modules and managing the lifetime of our modules as well, and then passing them on to our layout manager, who's gonna place them in the overall application shell. And one way that the dispatcher can know that it's time for us to load another module is a routing event. And what I really like about this is it means that the router is a feature of the application. It's not an architectural driver. It's something that sits on the side and raises events. It's the interaction of the other objects that gives us our rich, non-linear architecture. And then the last thing that we're going to need to add is similar to what we had in, in the marionette example, an application object that's responsible for kind of managing these higher level objects and making sure that they're communicating correctly. It's going to provide us a way for uh, an entry point for start, stop, uh, logging, cross-cutting concerns, all of those kinds of things would perhaps belong in this uh, overarching object. <clears throat> so we've split up some of our concerns that we had around state and events and all of the many views that were being displayed and the state of the address bar and we have a much more composable design. We were able to use events to transition into new states in a very non-linear fashion. So if that was all too long and you didn't read it because reasons, I'll sum it up. Um, management of our state space gets really, really hard especially if you don't separate out our concerns. So on the client, we shouldn't be using routes to address all aspects of the state space and definitely never transitions. Taking ideas from one context and applying them in a new context is really great. That's what building software is all about. Um, but it's not a rule book, right? We need to learn to be flexible and figure out when these patterns are actually hurting us more than they're helping us. And we need to mold them to support new requirements. So like the need to be stateful, like the need to embrace events within the same execution context. And I guess if I have one thing to say, it's that please don't build servers on the client because the client is a really rich, awesome place to like write code. And the events are awesome, so embrace them. That's it. <laughs>